Hey, everybody. Welcome to the da- Ooh, Let me start that again. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Player Engage podcast. Greg here. Today, we're joined by Matt Ambler, a video game and music producer in gaming. Uh, I'm really excited about this because this is a brand new territory for me right now. He's the head of music and game partnerships at Laced. Uh, Matt, I'll give it to you. You want to do a quick introduction? Talk about yourself. Yeah, so my name is Matt. I am the head of gaming and music partnerships at Laced, a keyword studio company. Prior to joining Laced, I worked as a freelance journalist for around five or six years, kind of specializing in the intersection of video games and music. Um, So it's been something that I've been researching and writing about for a very long time. Um, and I'm just a massive geek, to be honest, for all things video game music. So, yeah. That's awesome. I'm excited to have you here. Matt, Matt's really pretty heavy poster on LinkedIn, and I see all the crazy news he finds out about the latest mashups between different studios and different whatever pop culture things are out there. And, you know, it's one of these things that we always talk about the player experience on, on the Player Engage podcast. And, and I love that, but we don't often think about how we, we get immersed into the actual game itself and music plays a huge role in that uh before we get too deep into that what got you here i guess my first question would be what did you want to be when you grew Mm. up and how did you end up here i initially wanted to be a journalist full-time um so i remember applying for games journalism jobs when i was coming out of university um not having much luck it's a really incredibly competitive space um kind of sent emails out asking how you get into the space what do you do started learning that i need to build a portfolio because all of my writing samples were just like weird creative stories from university and stuff like that um so yeah did that and then when i first started writing for a couple of different gaming outlets i realized that um gaming i think regardless of like whether you work in content creation journalism like or you're trying for a dev job testing qa or whatever like it's an incredibly competitive like landscape because there are so many gamers out there who love all aspects of gaming and naturally it makes sense that they'd want to turn that into a career so quite quickly i learned that i kind of need to niche down as a writer because if I'm approaching PRs and publications kind of going, oh, I'd love to review like the new Zelda game. They're naturally like, yeah, who's this guy? We've already got loads of writers we work with or what, do you know what I mean? It's not, it's not easy. So to me, it was like, I need to find a niche. And that niche for me was music and video games because I've always been a musician um started playing keyboard when i was like six seven years old then i picked up drums joined a band we toured the uk and europe it was a metal band called demoralizer um and what got me into metal in the first place was video games right because i remember when i was like nine or ten years old like playing tony hawk's pro skater and listening to bands like Dead Kennedys and Suicidal Tendencies and AFI, Murderhead, stuff like that. Like my parents were not into that music. So there was no way for me to have exposure to alternative music at that age, right? So for me, it was games like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater and then FIFA, um, SSX Tricky, all of these other games with like heavily licensed soundtracks, GTA as well, True Crime. Um, that shaped my music taste, I think, in such an incredible way. And that was something that I never really realized until I kind of thought about what I wanted to write about. Do you know what I mean? Like when I was trying to carve a name for myself as a journal, and I was like, well, I need to write about this stuff because there's nobody who's really dedicated like their writing time to just doing that. So I was like, right, so there's an opportunity here to basically just write about that from the perspective of the impact that it's had on me in terms of shaping my music taste, but also like a lot of the stuff that I share on LinkedIn, just kind of like who's doing what, um, what kind of collaborations are taking place between music companies and games companies, why are these collaborations taking place, what do they mean for players, so just all of that stuff really. There's a lot to break down there, so I'm going to take it piece by piece, and there's one particular point I want to just talk about because i love it first is you want to be a writer 
you realize that it's a busy market. I mean, it's yeah. crowded. Everyone wants to write about the latest Zelda, right? How do you make yourself different? There you go. You, you find music. And, and I just feel like music is such an afterthought until it's not. And then it's yeah. the biggest thing in the game. And I actually had this conversation with a friend earlier this week because I knew you and I would be talking about it. I was talking about Tony Hawk. I loved that game. Yeah. It was such a great game. And what made that game, it was a good game, but was the soundtrack. And we yeah. saw with crazy taxi for people that know that is crazy taxi came out on dreamcast started off with the offspring awesome beginning of a song and then all of a sudden they remastered it remade it and came out the soundtrack was different people hated it it's because the soundtrack was different but tony hawk and and this is way off topic of anything we're talking about like it introduced everyone to a a bunch of new bands or they Mm. brought their favorite music punk music into a game that they never thought would exist and skateboarding was so hot are there why don't games like this exists anymore that takes so much music from pop culture that's popular and infuse it into the game. And yeah, you have games like Beat Saber, but that's such a niche as well, right? Not everyone mm. has a headset, but like, can you redo that that type of game or is it going to be too expensive? Is it too hard? Is it like even skateboarding isn't as popular as it was and maybe it will make a resurgence, but it's just like, how do we get back to that era? Because yeah. that was a great era. I think the big difference now is we've got Spotify, right? So, like, when I was playing those games as a kid, and I'm sure, like, when people were playing those games as adults, that was a cool way to actually discover new bands. Like, same thing, I guess, with, like, GTA 3 and stuff like that, which I believe was probably, like, LimeWire, like, just the start of, like, digital music distribution. So you can jump into these games and not know what music you're going to encounter, And that's a great way of kind of dipping your toes into genres that you might not like listen to otherwise. Like there's probably a lot of songs in Tony Hawk's Pro Skater where if they'd have come on the radio at the time or whatever else, I wouldn't have paid any attention to them. But because they're part of this game that I'm really enjoying and because I'm hearing them like over and over and over again, that sucks me in, right? Um, I mean, there are still plenty of games with like, big licensed soundtracks today um like these big open world games that have in-game radios I'm, I'm sure there are like there's probably a generation of kids now that are playing fortnite and listening to the in-game radio in that in the fortnite islands that are having that same experience that we had back then but i don't think it's as powerful because it's so easy to consume music nowadays and i think music is devalued now i think just because of spotify and you know what i mean it's so easy just to click through tracks it's kind of taken the value away from music whereas like i literally i remember hearing um the offspring in crazy taxi because it was all i want wanted yeah 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 I remember hearing that going out and buying a load of offspring cds my pocket money did the same thing with goldfinger in tony hawk's pro skater when i heard superman i was like oh what type of music is this oh this is like punk rock and ska I think that's something I'm into. I'm going to go out and buy loads of Goldfinger albums. So I bought Open Your Eyes, buy Goldfinger, bought Hang Ups. So there was that. Whereas nowadays, there isn't that kind of sentimental attachment to music. So I think, unfortunately, we'll never get back to that with the caveat and without going kind of too deep into it. there There are new things emerging, right? So if you look at these virtual concerts where you've got Travis Scott, like doing Fortnite. Um, there was a really cool concert in Sky, Children of the Light, where Aurora did this like 45 minute um, concert experience. I was part of that, like I played it, and that took me back to being a kid where it was kind of like I'm having this really powerful connection with music. And as well, if you've played Tetris Effects or Res Infinite in VR, like, when you experience, and I guess Beat Saber as well to some extent, there are still games out there where you get that kind of like dopamine hit, I guess, that like we got when we were younger playing these games. Um, But I think they're few and far between, or at least they feel few and far between because there's so many games coming out nowadays, right? Like, I don't know what your backlog is like, but mine is absolutely horrendous like there's so much stuff i want to play but i can't get around to it because i've got enough time now in my schedule to play maybe one game a month do you know what i mean yeah it's funny yeah I, i'm with you and i like the fact that you're proud about 
this dopamine hit because I think that's a great way to put it. So I'm going to attempt to play music through this platform and I've never done it before, but we'll see if this works. But this is the first song. I don't know if you hear this. Yeah. This is the first song when I was young. One of the first games I ever beat, right? This is the last level of Sonic 1. And I just remember hearing this song and it gave me chills. I'm just like, wow, this is awesome. And to this day, I, I love that. And it's like... It's not a licensed song, right? It's part of Sonic. It's not like it's just an in-game song that just kind of blew my mind, and it was just so exciting to hear. And, and like I still play it today. Today, it pumps me up in yeah. this way, and I think the dopamine hit is the right way to do it. And I guess you're right with Spotify, right? People get these options all of a sudden. Even with sorry, I didn't mean Spotify. I meant the in-game radios, right? You're playing GTA. I don't like this song. I can skip it. I can skip it. I, you said FIFA. I think back to Madden, right? Or like years ago, Madden just had this killer soundtrack right it went from country music which i don't normally like but i still listen to the songs to rap it and over the years i think it's just become more rap 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 yeah. rap which fine i'm okay with rap but like the jarring difference between a country song followed by like a bubba sparks followed by some other random pop song was just like this is a wild mix but i love it and it just becomes now all right i don't like this station i'm gonna switch this station i feel like this takes away something but mm. it also adds a nice element to the player that helps them get more involved in the game Hmm. Oh. So I don't know. Uh, that's that's kind of my thought there. Is was there a specific song that was the first song in gaming that kind of like my song with Sonic that kind of sucked you into this? Probably Sonic was the first ever game I played that I remember playing. So I think I've got definitely like a nostalgia thing going on for like Green Hill Zone. Um, in terms of the music that like hits me now, probably say Zelda's Lullaby, like just because obviously that's in like I remember hearing that for the first time in Ocarina of Time, and I think the nature of the way songs are composed in Ocarina of Time, the fact that there's so few notes using a lot of the melodies, they're catchy, they're almost like little pop hooks, they stick with you. Um, but I recently just finished Tears of the Kingdom. And the way they use Zelda's lullaby in that and then flip it into different keys and then build it up and add these new instruments into it, like, it's absolutely wild. So I think it it makes sense, right? Everything you were saying then about the um, final... Is that Sonic 2 or Sonic 1, the final? Sonic 1. Sonic 1, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, It sticks with you because you remember that music playing during a certain moment usually quite a pivotal moment in the game whether it's like sonic one where it's like last battle or like me hearing zelda's lullaby where i think you see zelda for the first time in ocarina of time so it's that it plays such an important role in the narrative as well it sticks with you it just shows you right specific Mm. experiences that you build into the game just reminisce with you right i remember what level i was on i remember the music that was playing it all you don't forget it's part of that experience that's important yeah What's the day-to-day job like of the head of music and game partnerships? So I am kind of part-time at the moment. Um, When I am in, at the moment, it is fielding a lot of requests. I think people are growing more aware of the opportunities that are in gaming from an artist perspective. We get a lot of managers reaching out, um, artists too, inquiring about opportunities. At the same time, we get our clients on the gaming side who might be looking to do something with specific artists in a certain genre and want our suggestions on who might be open to what. Um, We're constantly chatting to artists as well in terms of what games they're playing because that's a super important thing for me, right? Because I don't want to kind... Anything that I do in terms of getting artists into games or fielding that kind of stuff... I want to make sure where possible there's a genuine link there between the artist and the game. Like I don't want to push a load of music from artists into a game if they don't actually enjoy playing video games, right? Because I don't think that's fair on the fans because ultimately what we're doing should be, yeah, should we deliver a cool music experience in game or if we're doing something outside of the game, like a remix album or an arrangement album, um, yeah, it needs to be fun. It needs to sound good. It needs to make sense. But 
it needs to make sense for the fans and fans need to be into it. And I think that can only happen when the musicians and the artists that you're collaborating, co- collaborating with are genuine fans of um, the gaming IP. So I don't know if you've played, um, have you played Neon White? I have not. So have you, have you seen that game? Nope, I'm play- pulling it up now. So it is essentially um, a magic, it's made by Ben Esposito who did um, Donut County. So it's essentially Mirror's Edge meets a first person shooter meets like Jet Set Radio. It's like this really weird hybrid of like almost lost Dreamcast games. And the game has this really cool vibe. But um, Ben reached out to a person called um, Machine Head, who is like glitchy kind of break core music, does some really cool stuff. But he absolutely loves video games, like specifically like that era of like really Japanese Dreamcast and PS2 games, right? The ones that were quite obscure and like never made it outside of Japan. So the music that he wrote, for neon white basically just sound it takes you back in time because it reminds me of the soundtracks of the games that i was playing on ps2 and dreamcast right so i think that's a really great example of like the artist is into the game has been asked by someone working on the game to get involved and that collaboration has worked because he's understood the vision i think sometimes like if you're working with artists who aren't necessarily a fan of the gaming ip or don't understand gaming there's a risk that they might not get the direction of the project which is why i'm always interested in talking to artists who basically love and breathe live and breathe video games um i think that's super important is your so in that example right you you had a game that needed a soundtrack or a song for a soundtrack mm. and they reached out to someone and say, Hey, will you create a song for us? Right. And it's great. Right. He was excited because it's the type of game they play, but I'm sure there's often times when a game needs a sound or soundtrack or song it where you look at stuff that's already created, right? Like mm. how, what happens more often? I don't know if that's even a, a real question, right? Is it more often that someone's creating a new, new song for something? Or are you looking at assets that are already created? Um, in terms of creating original, do you mean in terms of like reference material and stuff? And when you're working on new music, for general, if I'm creating a new game and I want to, if I want to create a soundtrack, what what's the best practice for me as a game creator? Ooh, I mean, it depends. So I guess this is where I look back to the composers that I've interviewed and the developers that I've interviewed in my former life as a freelance journal. Um, there's numerous different ways you can do this if you're in indie studio um and you've got a smaller team um so ben esposito who did um by the way we we didn't work on the music for neon white i just want to put that out there but i did want to talk about it because it's one of my favorite game soundtracks it's it's amazing but he's a cool example of someone who because he developed this game he already had in his head like this sonic like landscape for the game, right? He knew the sound that he wanted and he was also a huge Machine Head fan. So sometimes it can be a case of that, right? Where you might be a studio head and you've got a game that you've worked on and you think you already know what sound you want because it's it's your baby, right? Do you know what I mean? Like you know where the sound needs to go. And that's where you can, you can reach out to an artist directly, depending on how big they are, obviously, um, and try and work something out. Or you might have a couple of different ideas in mind, but you're not sure of the best way to tip, like the best route to go down. Or you might just kind of think, you know what, we'd love a soundtrack that's similar to this game or that game. Or we've been playing this album loads recently in the studio. We'd love to get someone like that involved, but we don't know how to do that in terms of we don't know how to approach composers. We don't know what that right structure is going to look like. We don't know what a fair price is to pay and all that kind of stuff. That's where you can come to a studio like us and we will work with you to try and find the right musical direction for your game. Or you could just go down the third route of you, you've you got a composer that you work with, right? And most composers um, are contractors. They work freelance, um, but there's so many amazing composers out there. And then, 
you will work with them in terms of you brief them and just kind of go, look, here, here are the basic ideas we've got for the music, but you pass that over to the composer or audio director, and then they're going to work with you on creating that sonic palette for your game, basically. It's interesting because, you know, I feel like soundtracks are typically an afterthought and i'm i'm just the outsider looking in right yeah, you're correct and i know when when you're selling something like oh you want to start thinking about this since before you even create the game right you want to have a soundtrack but when's the realistic time of looking at a soundtrack do you want to be have something playable you want to just have a thought is it vary as i would say as early as possible like or, or at least as early as possible because right you've got to you've got to take the economics into account right because if you've got a vague idea for the game that you want to make, but like you're, it might change depending on game mechanics or like funding or whatever else. You don't want to onboard a composer as a contractor on like a two or three year. Again, depending on like what kind of deal structure you've got, because a lot of composers charge by minute. But there's no point paying for someone and just kind of getting them on board, but you're not ready for the game to go out yet. Do you know what I mean? So I'd say at least have like your base build sorted, have a clear vision for the game. And when maybe you've started thinking about a proper roadmap and when you want to get that game out, speak, get the composer like as soon as you can, because the composer should be working with you to flesh out like the soundscape of the game. Do you know what I mean? I've interviewed so many composers as a freelance journal and one of their biggest complaints has been we were brought onto the project too late um or we were brought onto the project during a really messy time in development which meant that i was writing music for a certain part of the game or level but then it got scrapped so then i've got to completely throw away what i've done and then start again so i guess that's a long-winded way of saying there's there's never the there's never a perfect time, but if you're confident that your game is kind of on track and everything is going well, get the composer in. And second thing, I cannot stress this enough, if you are thinking about a physical soundtrack release or digital distribution for your game soundtrack, let the composer know as well as soon as you can, rather than kind of turning around last minute or to end, the end of the project and going, we'd also like you to do a soundtrack release because releasing a game soundtrack as a product is a lot different to composing music for a game, right? Because as soon as that becomes a product, that then needs to be something that can be listened to outside of the game and enjoyed in its own right. And that's where music might need stretching out. You've no longer got the beats of the game to rely on, so you've lost that dynamic nature. Everything needs to be in a certain order. But the same way as an album, it needs to take the listener on a journey right so there's all of those different things to consider it's fascinating uh, this is beyond what i would even imagine like when i'm thinking <laughs> the outside in but it's right like i'm trying to think to myself and i feel like this is a straightforward answer but like these dopamine hits that we talked about right like hmm. are these planned in advance like hey we're going to come in here with this soundtrack right or when you start mario 64 and we're playing that music and the camera's sprawling around right like that's clearly like are they designed at the same time? Like, here's the soundtrack, and as the soundtrack is going, this is what we want to happen, and we just kind of pan that whole vision out? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, again, having not been directly in those conversations, it's hard to, like, say, yeah, absolutely. But, yeah, because you've got to think of it as any other project, right? Where if it's a creative project, let, let's say you're working on a film script or tv script or whatever else or an advert like you've got certain moments during that creative process during the visual and audio process where you want to hit the viewer or listener right and it's the same thing in a game like you where you've got those moments of emotional intensity you want to ramp things up so when composers are writing game soundtracks like most cases definitely in triple a They've got the game scene in front of them, like at least four. If the if they're scoring a cinematic part of the game, like a cutscene or something, they can see what's happening, so they know when certain things need to go up and down. And I mean, off the top of my head, there's so many moments in gaming that I can think of, like 
Super Mario 64, the whole camera panning thing with like Lucky to like you were talking about then the way the music kind of, and then at the end, and it builds up. Um, the sound effects as well, that's like a massive thing. The chest opening thing in Ocarina, well, all Zelda games, that chest opening sound effects. Um, sound effects are massive, and that definitely is a dopamine thing. I mean, look at the way that um, if you've ever listened to Charlie XCX's Boys, that, oh, he's thinking that, boys, and you've got the Mario coin sound effects, that, like, just as a listener, like, if you're a gamer, that's like, oh, that... What's this pop song trying to drag me in with these really familiar gaming sounds? Suddenly it doesn't sound too bad. It's almost, you know what I mean? It's that kind of thing. Um, but music cues as well, right? So it's not just original music. It can be licensed music as well. So have you played the Life is Strange games before? I've played them, yep. Yep. Yeah. There's a moment, um, I think it's episode four in the first Life is Strange where there's a horrible scene where you basically dig up the body of someone. And as you're doing that and the camera's kind of panning around and you're seeing these characters about to get like emotionally devastated, there's a certain song cue that hits and it's um, a song by night. It's called Message to Bears. Um, the song's called, I think the song's called Mountains. And it's just a really like somber, like acoustic guitar song. And it just hits like right at the, do you know what I mean? And even thinking about it now, I'm like, God, that was, that was like a, part of the game that really got me and then there's the um i think it's gears of war 2 where i guess i'm not talking about spoilers now am i when it's gears of war that's a long that's a long long time ago we've passed enough years i think it's yeah. okay i think is it um i think it's dom who dies in gears of war 2 it's either two or three um and he basically goes on like a suicide run where there's all of these locusts and he knows that right i'm in this big like van thing and i've got loads of forgotten what the explosive material is in the game on the back. And he just drives it into a horde. But as he's doing that, um, Mad World plays. And it's still like one of my favorite scenes in gaming. And I'm like, that was like a perfect... The, it's the whole Stranger Things, right? Kate Bush. Like, everyone was talking about that all over radio, all over TV. Like, it sent Kate Bush to number one when they played that song in Stranger Things, um, Running Up Those Hills. But there's been loads of other moments like that in gaming, maybe to not like that commercial awareness and success. Do you know what I mean? But there's loads of moments like that out there. The the Strange World Gears of War, I remember the commercial, was one of the most amazing gaming commercials I've ever seen. I remember being in college and like we were all sitting around like, holy shit, this is going to be amazing. Yep. Like you couldn't come up with a more perfect sound for that seen than that was and i know they tried to other games tried to do similar things yep. like every year call of duty comes out with their new trailer but like gears of war just nailed it right at the gate can you can you remember the um dead was it the dead island trailer the where newer it, one. Oh yeah the, the, the very the, first one plays really, backwards they, yeah they, they kind of spoofed gears of war and they spoofed something else as well i think it, both of them I, I creative stuff yep um, but music and trailers as well, I think that's another like important thing because that sets the turn for the game as well. Um, Square Enix for Final Fantasy XV did a lot of stuff with um, Florence and the Machine and they kind of had that music in the announcement trailers and stuff as well and just in the marketing materials as well. It was in-game, but just having that in the run-up to a game coming out as well, like especially when it features in the game, kind of like sets that emotional turn for what you're expecting, right? I, I, I love that stuff in Final Fantasy. Square Enix always does a really solid job, I think, of music in games, just thinking about some of the stuff that Uematu's has written for the Final Fantasy games over the years. Like, that's just ridiculously good. I'll have to check them out. I normally don't venture too much into the Japanese RPGs or just normally RPGs in general, but... uh Knowing that, and I think as I'm getting older, I like these calmer things, you know, yeah. I, I like to be able to see what that's like. It should be interesting. I want to take a quick time out here because I'd like to ask some like rapid fire questions, quick answers. Matt has no idea what's going to happen here. Uh, so we'll surprise him. It's normal, easy questions. So don't think about it. So ready? Yeah. If you're going to go to a bar, what type of drink are you ordering? Glass of red. All right. Last game you played. Tears of the Kingdom. 
What did you have for breakfast? I had a single slice of brown toast with half a tin of Heinz baked beans. There you go. It's proper English English <laughs> stretcher. I normally ask the last book, but instead of asking the last book, I'm going to ask you what's the last soundtrack you listen to. Uh, I've forgotten the name of the game. There's a really cool indie game soundtrack that I've been listening to today by a French composer, but I can't remember the name of the game. So I'm going to say um, the DLC for Sonic Frontiers. Um, I've had that on repeat. It's incredible. If you're going to listen to a soundtrack, what is your medium of choice? It's YouTube, which I feel like is a really YouTube. weird platform to use. Yeah. For the record, everyone, lacedrecords.com has some awesome vinyl vinyl covers. I'm going to be hopefully purchasing some. I want to put them on my wall behind me so <laughs> I, they can pop. I, 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 I should be saying vinyl, then. shouldn't I? I take that back. It's vinyl. It's vinyl. Exclusively you vinyl. <laughs> you know, it's funny. We talk about that a lot. Like, well, what's the medium of choice? And I, I've been going to YouTube a lot recently, but like, mm. I have these nice speakers downstairs. When you play them through YouTube, you just get the center channel. I'm just like, oh, I want to play properly. Um, last question, ideal vacation. I've just been Japan. Boom, crossed it off. He's send, done. send me back. Not traveling ever back. again. Cool. That's, a, that, that's the end of our Spitfire round. You did well there. Um, Thank you. Is there a pet peeve that you see happening in the industry around music that, that you're just not a big fan of? Well, it's a good thing you said music because I would have just said the mass layoffs because I find that wild. The fact that we constantly big up the fact that gaming is the biggest form of entertainment, one of the biggest industries in the world, yet people are getting laid off left, right, and center, and there seems to be no job security. Um, in music, I'd say there's a risk that some studios can sometimes play it too safe with certain game soundtracks. Um, I think there's a lot of AAA games that sound the same nowadays, whereas going back to the PS1, PS... I mean, PS1, N64 era, I think we've got to remember as well that I guess the reason a lot of stuff sounds the same now is because you're getting the best orchestras in the world, everything's recorded properly... Whereas back in the day, you had the actual console sound fonts, kind of. Do you know what I mean? It was the chips that were set in the sound. So Sega Mega Drive games sounded so amazing, or Genesis games even, because of the Genesis sound chip. Do you know what I mean? Same with SNES and stuff like that. Whereas now, I think a lot of music does... It's almost like that Hans Zimmer epic orchestral thing. So when a game like Neon White comes along or when an indie game comes along and really dares to do something different with its soundtrack, that's when my ears kind of perk up and I go, oh, this is this is cool. So yeah, I'd say Peeve is a lot of soundtracks that sound the same. Um, other than that, I, th I think music and gaming right now is in a really good place, to be honest. Um, there's a lot more soundtracks coming out game studios are taking the music and games so much more seriously than they used to. Um, and I think the general public, their kind of impression of gaming and game music by association is changing. The fact you've got the Grammys recognizing video game music with the first ever Grammy for video game music in 2022. Um, you've got the BBC proms in the UK celebrating video game music in its own concert um i don't know what it's like in the us but over here we've got like dedicated video game music shows like on the bbc bbc radio 3 sound of music and stuff like that so there's a lot more going on so which which is great yeah we uh i have a buddy that's big into listening to music gaming mm. soundtracks when he's working he says it just gets him in the zone yeah i don't know if we have any stations that are dedicated to it but that's a, a awesome place to be with the uh with the rise of AI and it taking over the world, uh, we hear a lot about writing and, and how people are worried about it and artwork, but we don't often talk about, at least from my my audience that I listen to, right? We don't mm. often talk about audio. And I think that's one that's probably a big one that's coming up as well. Or there's a lot of tools out there. Is, is this a threat to the industry? Do you think it's obvious when the AI comes up with music versus someone else? Are there ticks that you notice? From... 
from an audio perspective, I don't think it's a threat because games are always going to need original music written in a certain way. Um, I feel like within gaming, AI in general as a word has a really negative connotation, but I think it's important to understand that there are certain AI tools that can improve workflows. Um, I've interviewed composers about this, that there's AI systems that they can use to basically make programming dynamic music in video games a lot more smoother. Um, That's not taking anything away from anyone else's job. It's normally making their job a lot easier because you can get some cases where a composer rather than a programmer is tasked with kind of making music dynamic or whatever else. So that's where that can help. Um, So I don't see it as a threat yet. I guess it depends what comes on the horizon, right? And what's kind of put in place. I can understand why some people would be concerned. And I understand that I think there's a concern, especially with bigger corps, that they might get rid of some staff and start using AI tools or whatever else. Um, But I think we also need to have conversations where we can talk about the viable practicalities of AI and like how they can improve stuff rather than just instantly jumping on stuff and kind of going AI bad because AI steal job. Do you know what I mean? Like stuff like that. So as of yet, I'm not fearful, but I'm happy to change my opinion if something pops up and then kind of proves me otherwise. I think something that's important to note is AI is here, right? Once once something's introduced to the public, you're probably not going to take it away from the public, right? So maybe it's not good for the industry and I'm not a huge fan of it. But at the same time, you need to start to embrace it because if you're yeah. not embracing it, you're gonna you're gonna fall prey to it. It's the people that are going to to not try to use these tools, and, and it sucks. It does mm. suck, right? But it's also a great opportunity to learn these tools and, and maybe build stuff that's a little more productive or quicker or more efficient, right? But there's yeah. ways to utilize this stuff, and I think it's important to take a look at it like that. Yeah, and I think as well from a music perspective, real quickly, if these tools encourage people to experiment with music or get into playing music who might actually because because you're not know picking up a guitar or a piano or whatever when you've got no musical skill at all like it, that can be scary right Do you know what i mean it takes a long time but if there's tools that i guess almost act as that gateway and let people do cool stuff as long as it's not ripping off or stealing other people's work or being fraudulent or whatever. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm all, I'm all here for it. Cool. I have, I think one last question for you and maybe, maybe we'll change as we go on here. But uh, my last question to you, is there have been any cool, I think I, I look at your LinkedIn and you talk about these partnerships and collaborations, anything recent coming up that maybe you want to say, Hey, this is going to be exciting. Check it out. Oh, what, where should people focus their time? Riot games releases an anthem for worlds which is basically like the big league of legends esports tournament that happens every year um i've i still need to listen to this year's anthem i think it came out today but they also have they always absolutely smash it out of the park so i'd say a hundred percent that um ubisoft is doing some really cool stuff with its trailers um they're worked on by uh, um, a, they do a lot of work with a company called Feel for Music, and their trailer work is really, really good. Um, speaking of trailer work, buzzing with the Lace team for we put out a trailer recently for Lords of the Fallen, which we got Iron Maiden onto Fear of the Darkness, and it it worked so well, and I'm excited because I can't wait to play Lords of the Fallen as well. Um, in terms of interesting music collaborations in general that encourage people to keep an eye on what's happening in the mobile market um i think mobile games do not get anywhere near the amount of attention they deserve um especially from gaming press and i say that as someone who is a former freelance journal um i think garena free fire has more players than Fortnite. yeah it's rarely talked about in the press um garena free fire has also had concerts with the likes of justin bieber and again, that was reported on nowhere near like anywhere similar to like Fortnite or anything like that. So there's a lot of amazing stuff happening in mobile. You just need to look. You need to 
There's a lot of amazing stuff happening in mobile. You just need to search quite hard to actually find it, unfortunately. But there is some really cool stuff happening out there. That's a, a question I always like to talk about with people. Like, there's so much news. Where where do you get your news from? I will admit that I basically have keywords set up for like, so I, I've got a spreadsheet where I track anything that I'm at risk of missing, right? You know, in terms of like video game music stories, video game music collaborations, partnerships, integration. So I do a lot of tracking. So a lot of the news that I get that is more left field just comes straight into my inbox. Um, other than that, Games websites, Video Games Chronicle is probably one of my favorite websites at the moment because I think there's a lot of video game websites that kind of run a lot of opinion pieces and stuff like that, but don't do much reporting. Um, Video Games Chronicle does so much original reporting. They get loads of scoops, so get a lot of stuff from there. Um, But I think also newsletters, like... I, I I didn't buy into the newsletter thing at first because I was like, why do, why would I want to subscribe to newsletters when I can just visit gaming websites? But then I subscribed to a couple of them, was finding out all of this amazing stuff that I'd never read on gaming websites. And I was like, all right, cool. So I'd say the vast majority of stuff that I find out now is from video game newsletters, you know, where from people working in the industry, right, who are sharing that kind of like first hand, like it might be surveys or like interviews with devs or like, um, I really like the um, Deconstructor of Fun. Does some really cool um, deep dives into mobile games and like deconstructions of why is this game that came out two weeks ago on mobile suddenly sort of the most downloaded game in the world? What kind of game mechanics is it using? Like, how does it monetize? All of that kind of stuff. Like, all of that like geeky mechanical stuff. I'm really, really into. Um, so yeah, newsletters. Um, game Discover Co is a really good newsletter. Um, there's the bullet points newsletter as well from an ex Kataki editor, um, and a couple of others. Cool thing with Substack as well is once you subscribe to these newsletters, you get recommendations basically going, you enjoyed reading this. Maybe you'd enjoy reading that. So it's just like a constant, like you're just constantly finding new stuff. I appreciate that. I'll have to pick up a few of these. Uh, I think I've recently got into newsletters because I realized they'll email me first thing in the morning. I could lay in bed and just yep. quickly scroll through some emails and start picking up information like that. But on that note, um, Matt Ambler from Laced, I appreciate you coming on. I, I've been talking a lot about music, not a lot, not as much as you, so I can't say a lot recently. And it's exciting just to be able to talk from someone from the player experience from this side because we often talk about it from customer support side but it, mm. the whole immersive blah, 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 blah. the whole immersive effect all comes in i think with music and i think it's probably one of the last the, probably the most the thing that remains most in my mind after playing yeah. a game is the music and i was really excited about having this so with that would you like to take the floor do you want to plug anything plug yourself go to town if you like video game music as much as i do you should definitely head to the Laced website. Um, Just go on Google, just type in Laced Records. We've got so many amazing video game soundtracks that are up for sale. Um, Even if you don't have a record player, these are really good, just like collector's pieces for specific games. So definitely check that out. Um, And just, if you enjoy a piece of music in a game, like think about how you can support the composer in the studio like leave comments on tracks on youtube get in touch with composers tell them you love their music um if they've got Bandcamp, there's a thing called Bandcamp friday where if an artist has music on Bandcamp, 100 percent of the royal is goes to the artist support artists support game developers um i think there's so much negativity in games industry right now just because of all the layoffs i think it's nice to kind of spread some good news so yeah if you have played an amazing game listen to an amazing soundtrack let the team responsible for that know um and spread some love and positivity love it thank you matt this was a a fun podcast i'm excited for people to be able to hear it as matt mentioned i'll also have the laced records website linked on our website our player engaged website if there's any 
other information, Matt, you want me to share and let me know. But this has been a, a fun experience. I, I appreciate you coming on today. And I'm looking forward to uh, a having some uh, laced records on my wall here. So <laughs> we can color it up and start making a little more gaming. I'm hold here. You to that. And, and uh, yeah, and uh, I look forward to continuing to talk to you and work with you. Uh, thanks for coming on today. Awesome. Thank you very much, Greg. It's been a pleasure.